most of the people like the Dennis Quaid's, the Ben Silverman's, the, oh my gosh, all, the Steve Levitans, all these people that I've been lucky enough to meet, the one thing that they have is a curious mind. I think there's many people that are get, get to a level of success and they don't want to go anywhere near ideas that are dangerous or new or not theirs. Dennis could have easily just said, you know, upon meeting me, you know what, I'm happy doing film and TV, dude, good luck. The curiosity, the openness of his mind and his willingness to, he's a serious guy, but to not, uh, he's willing to take risks and even do silly and funny things like, our marketing video that we did for the podcast on cassette tape, which I, you know, had pitched him. He, when he likes something, he'll just first sit there and digest something and go, ah! And like, that's when you know he likes something. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. I'm super fired up to have a really unique interview with you guys today, talking about a new, a new podcast platform that you guys are going to be super excited to learn more about and dive into. I have the one and only Jared Goodstat with me today. I just want to start off by saying, Jared, thanks for spending the time with me today. Hey, man. Uh, great to uh, be part of this. Uh, we are, sorry for some of the chaos behind me. We are in no, uh, exceptional times at the moment. Right now, we're recording this in the, the midst of uh, COVID, so we're improvising our day-to-day, -day, much like everybody else in the world. But I'm psyched to be here to talk about uh, audio up. This is essentially where I've been launching the business from. Not every day that people launch a new content studio from the extra bedroom in their, their home. But uh, I got to say, as an entrepreneur and as a creator, this very much reminds me of where I started when I started Jingle Punks. I, was in a, I lived in an apartment that was essentially the same size as this room every day with my laptop, with my microphone, with my you know, Apogee Duet and the tools around me never felt hampered by the fact that I didn't have a giant 100 track Neve board or the most expensive Pro Tools rig. I uh, truly, you know, this has reminded me why I create in the first place. And at a time when I think a lot of people have uh, lost a sense of uh, purpose or, you know, feeling struggling with maybe getting up day to day, I'm, you know, trying to, you know, just reignite that passion every day right now. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. I think a lot of people when they're trying to come up with a new creative endeavor think they need all the fancy tools and things of that nature to get started. It's like, no, there's are plenty of cheap ways that you can go about creating it. And if you're doing it for the right reasons and you really have a passion for it, you're going to find a way to make that happen, right? I go to bed with a list of 20 things I want to accomplish the next day and I wake up and I look at the list and then I cross three things off and then get going. Like, that's, you know, uh, it's hard, I think, working from your own uh, home sometimes because there's no off switch. So there's been days where I've worked so much that I felt physically run down or ill. But now I'm really starting to find, or at least today, <laughs> so, you know, starting to try to find my balance. You know, I worked out this morning before I started this. It helps me put away all the yesterday, start the day fresh, and then really at a set time, start my day. I'm going to try today to set my lunch at a certain time and then try and turn it off at the end of the day. But uh, the one phenomenon that's happened during COVID is that people have said that because of the the Zoom nature of everything, it requires more energy than a typical office day. And it requires more attention and brain calories that you couldn't get away with if you were on a conference call. Like on many conference calls, I'm like this, closing my eyes, like looking yeah. at my phone. This is, you know, in a weird way, what I'm in communication right now, it's direct, it is focused, and and maybe that's why I feel like I'm getting more done. I don't know. Huh. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting for sure. Um, well, so you said you always write down 20 things the night before? Is it always 20? Mm -hmm. I try to make it actually less, but sometimes my mind expands. And, you know, I, I've found... Oh, I, I'm really discovering all the old things that I've been doing. I found these like stick on white sheets. And the cool thing about them is they're static on the wall. So as soon as the static wears off, it literally falls off like it drapes off. And if I haven't accomplished things by the time it falls off the wall, there's no reason to rewrite it. It wasn't important. So I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't even look at the list. I, I actually have a glimpse of it right there. And I'm like, wow, those things I wrote down that I thought were so important 10 days ago, they're not important now. So it's just there to remind me to see it and go, you know, if I have a blank time during the day, what else is on there that I should be picking away at? But, you know, I would say 20 is probably too much. I, I would say that people should, you know, five to 10 
things that they want to accomplish. And those things can be, you know, uh, order that piece of, you know, workout material on Amazon. You forget to do those things, you know, and not everything I'm writing down is work related. Some of them is, Hey, uh, where'd that tax form go from, you know, yeah. or, or cancel that subscription to the 10th streaming service. I don't need it's, it's so strange, but I'm like starting to get more organized in this little box here. Like, I don't know what it's going to look like when I finally leave here and have the infinite choice again. Yeah, no, I, I like how you do that. I'm a, a huge person. I have a, like a whiteboard right, right next to me that tells me exactly what I'm going to do um, as well. And, uh, you know, it also de- determine depends on how long each of those things are, the, the, nu- the number of 20 or five to 10 or anything like that. Well, let's start to start to get a little bit more into you. I'd say that through kind of my research around you to give you a little bit more of a introduction, you're kind of a producer, writer, inventor, entrepreneur. Um, and as a music producer and songwriter, you've collaborated with uh, multiple Grammy Award winner Jason Pooh Bear Boyd, uh, Miranda Lambert, Bob Dylan, Lil Wayne, and many others. And then your company, Jingle Punk Punks, as you mentioned before, transformed the TV marketplace. And then your new venture that I'm super stoked to talk more about is Audio Up. Um, and you're kind of looking to transform right here the podcast space. But before we get into that, I'd say that kind of through doing my research on you, that your almost like superpower, if you will, is being unique and being able to stand out. And I actually watched your TED talk on how to stand out. So I want to, and yeah, it was awesome. It was hilarious. So I want to ask you about like, how do you think people should go about trying to stand out and whatever it is that they need to be unique in? I think um, when you look at the major disruptors, whether across all media, whether it's film people, music people, magazine writers like the you know the hunter s thompson's of the world or you know the the music people like the dylans the beatles the little waynes the kanye's i don't think they necessarily set out to be different for different sake i think that some people uh there's a a very neat and tidy order of things in the music business and the film business and in fact i'm reading a really great book now about the formation of dreamworks with katzenberg geffen and spielberg and and sometimes in the film business, in the music business, you're just supposed to, when Bieber's cool, you're supposed to sound like Bieber. When Kanye's cool, you're supposed to sound like Kanye. When meteorite movies that destroy the earth are are cool or or in vogue, it's research that is basically looking to more things like it. I think we saw this last year with Old Town Road and music. It was so unique and original that at first it was like met with great resistance. And then eventually every single person in Nashville was putting trap beats and, and hip hop features on their songs, which is basically a repeatable cycle that had happened 10 years earlier and then 10 years before that. There's always going to be the, the, the left of center, the left stream or the outlaws that then become the mainstream, that then become copied. And then a new mainstream, you know, uh, gets set in place and new outlaws come in place. So what would Kurt Cobain be saying right now if he saw trap music? Would he be going, ah, oh, these, you know, this sucks, like, or would he be adapting and, and be this, uh, you know, person who is constantly evolving? We don't know. But, you know, at the time, someone like a Kurt Cobain was truly disruptive, transformational. And, you know, for me, I don't think I set out to disrupt, uh, you know, the music marketplace with, uh, with Jingle Punks originally. I think what happened was a lot of doors were closed because we didn't look the same as everybody else. We, we were corporate company that looked and acted like a band you know we always said that our mantra was let's go diy with the marketing let's have you know a young youthful approach to how we tell stories market create music and we did that and then you know i remember the first few times we knocked on the door of a place like mtv saying hey we want to do music for you at the very top level those doors were shut so we just walked the halls of the places where people our age were editing the shows and gave away the music for free, which ended up becoming how we got traction. So sometimes I think these people that are like the weird owls, like I talked about in my TED talk or the, the Bob Dylan's, they're only, you know, Bob Dylan came out, out at a time when his sound was so counter to everything else that was going, coming out there. You know, artists didn't write their songs. You know, you weren't supposed to, you know, play your own instruments on the records and, he basically, you know, was like, cool, I'm glad that you do it that way, but I'm going to do it this way. And, you know, through, and that's the same thing that happened with Outlaw Country. You know, you can't 
have your band cut on the records. That's just not a thing. And then uh, I would even say that somebody like, I'm just like canvassing all eras, like a soldier boy recording on Fruity Loops. He changed hip hop. Like he doesn't get a lot of credit because he's a big goofball, but that's something that's transformational. I go to big studios now with huge expensive equipment and people are like pulling up the Fruity Loops app. Why? Because that's that sound that they want to create. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you said how a lot of times things that are unique are initially met with resistance, but then over a certain amount of time, they, for whatever reason, can become accepted, kind of like you mentioned with Old Town Road. Do you think that the people who are initially met with resistance because of their uniqueness, do you think that the way they break through is simply by being persistent like you guys you guys kind of were with jingle punks by finding a way to give it away for free or do you think it's kind of a a mixture of being persistent and also actually having something great i i think it's a combination of of both i think that we were persistent and people would say to the point of annoyance early on only because we thought we had something so great that the world needed to hear um if you are just you know, I would go to sleep at night uh, again when I started Jingle Punks and I'd go, I'm watching TV. I think I can do better than the music that's on here. I know I can. So we assembled this ragtag group of the Jingle Punks and started creating. We'd watch TV. You know, early on, we got calls to do shows like Real Housewives, Pawn Stars and Pickers. And we, you know, many libraries, we just go, OK, here's all your tracks. We would like go into this like method recording thing where we would record Appalachian music using real, you know, old vintage mandolins, banjos, you know, spoons on a, on a washboard and, and try and create the sounds that we would like to have seen married to those cool images. Cause those shows over time, American pickers and pawn stars, there's some like authenticity to that, that I think came through through the marriage of really great storytelling and also music. Again, it's reality TV, so we don't take it all that seriously, but you know, even our work on housewives, uh, or later on the voice, we would do these deep dives where, you know, when we got an opportunity to pitch on the voice, we watched every movie that like had, you know, action elements to it, everything from Iron Man to Terminator. And we're like, you look at the stage of, of the voice and it looks like they're going to do battle to the death, but it's just a show about people singing. So we tried to like balance it between pop music and, you know, Iron Man. And that's where we came up with that. Dun, 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 dun. Like, and, and it was, uh, a, we didn't know what we were even trying to say till we heard it come through against the picture. And we're like, yeah, that's the sound. And we knew that before we even got the gig. And we're like, if we don't get it, it's only because of politics. And luckily that wasn't the case. Like there's people who are willing to try new things. And in fact, strangely enough, full circle, the new investors in my company, MGM, those are the people that created the voice. So here we are all these years later and I'm in business with these people in a totally different way. But they took a risk on me twice then and now by, by, you know, getting into business with us. And they always say, you know, we do our like annual catch up about, you know, when the voice relaunched, they're like, I don't know why it was that we even gave you an audition, but they remembered one time that it was because they had some smaller show that no one cared about called bully Beatdown on MTV, where a MMA fighter would come to your high school and beat the crap out of a local bully. And we ended up doing that show for them for nothing but I wrote funny music for it just to get their attention because it was such a big company. This was like a tiny, tiny show. And I wrote a song called, and they ended up thinking somebody at MTV called us and like, who made, who made this music? This is so dumb and so funny. And ultimately, you know, many times in my career, people have stopped in their tracks and they go, you know, we're trying to be taken seriously as business people. But I, uh, people go, who did this? This is so dumb and so funny and so weird. Who would have thought to do this? Like, it's like a, it's like a, you know, the needle scratching on the record, like, and that has happened so many times in my career. We've got people attention, people's attention by trying something different. I think when you're vanilla and you're trying to do the same, sometimes that works. But I mean, at moments of disruption, like what we're living in now, you know, again, I walked into Warner Records a few months ago, or a few, actually it was less than that, it was two months ago to pitch them audio up and the chairman tom corson goes what's the dumbest thing that you have here i want to see the silliest thing that you have and i showed him this character called uncle drank which is the sort of inventor of bro country he's the original chesney luke bryan you know uh 
uh, cheeseburger in paradise, no shoes wearing, sandal, flip flop guy. Yeah. And he goes, I love this. This is cr- like, why would you do think of this? And I was like, I don't know why I thought of it. Like, I just thought it'd be funny. I love country music, but I also like comedy. And, and here we are. And that's one of the first few projects that got a green light with an audio up. But it, it wasn't because you know, it was the coolest project in the world. It was because it was like silly, but also had the bones of like real structured music, you know? Yeah, no, I think, uh, like you said, I think that sometimes the willingness to be unique a lot of times is just your doorway in to get somebody's attention because uh, in in different industries, there's so many different ways or so many people creating noise that you have to find a way to create a little bit of a different noise in order to, to kind of get your get noticed. And something that you said earlier was was uh, something that I had a conversation with somebody else about on my podcast a couple months ago. And it's a interesting thought. You were watching kind of the TV and you were saying how I can make these jingles better or I can make this music better and so you went and did it and so I had a conversation with somebody else and they said the same thing about their career they saw somebody else doing it and they were like I can do it better and then I was like I think that's a great way for people to realize what they're passionate about and what they should go pursue because if you're watching somebody else thinking you can do it better yeah it wasn't from a sense of cockiness it was like I legitimately thought I could do it better like I think it would have been foolish for me to go, hey, there's the world's fastest runner in the world. I can run faster. That's just not, I don't, I'm not even, I don't even operate like that. In fact, I'm actually a bit of an introvert and very shy. So for me to wait my turn typically and be picked uh, like picked for my turn, like if I was like a typical songwriter, I would never get my turn because I'm not really going to, you know, in the world of Nashville, write a typical song like a florida georgia line cruise i'm not in the world of hip-hop gonna try and write you know uh a song like two phones or something like this like a super pop i I am going to i am best when i'm left to my own devices and when i feel like i have stumbled into something i then get noisy and then i'm kind of like you know then telling me no uh, you know that like no we won't give this a shot or no we won't look at it i think the first time i ever experienced that where, you know, again, it would be painful for me. I'd like, you know, to like speak up in high school and in college. It was, it literally was painful because I felt like a freak. I was just working on music and jokes literally alone most of the time, um, just in my cocoon, like learning how to use digital tools. And then the first time this occurred was I was working for a company called heavy.com. It was like a web 1.0 precursor to like YouTube or precursor to like, you know, a cross between YouTube and, and actually Vice, where people made their own edgy content. And they had this compilation uh, where all the coolest bands in New York City were getting on it. The Strokes, the White Stripes, the, like, you name it, like any of those early 2000 bands. And I was in a band at the time, and I recorded everything, you know, with these guys called uh, the Izzy's. It was myself and actually someone who would co- go on to found or be a partner at Jingle Punk's Jesse and this other guy made the demo submitted it to the compilation that and my boss who's now a good friend and mentor of mine said no and i went home that night and i listened to it again i was like fuck i know i'm gonna get in trouble for this but this guy doesn't know what he's talking about like this is like a this demo is competitive with everything that's on. and i went back and i was mad and i was like you're wrong and that was like a real break and he's like well i didn't know you'd be so upset about it i didn't know how passionate you were about you know this project okay let me listen to it again he's like you know what this is pretty good we'll put it on and that moment of courage led to we got on the BBC, we got invited to go to UK and do like a big tour there. We did we got on NME magazine and things started to happen. But I always said to myself, if I sat back and said, I'm just gonna be silent here and just let them be right about it, I don't know what I gained from this. It's like I didn't really care that much about that job. I knew that I wanted to do something in music, but I knew that I needed to start creating a profile and a stepping stone. So I'm not saying to always tell your boss to say you know, that he's wrong, but there are moments when, when you know in your heart that like you're right. And to this day, that demo like has carried me through intros with way bigger things. Like when I met T-Bone Burnett for the first time, who's like Bob Dylan collaborator, Oh Brother Without Thou, create like the ultimate tastemaker piece of all the things I worked on. He was like, what do you, what is, you know, what's your sound? And I played him that and he goes, 
what is this is great what is this i was like oh this is from like 20 years ago like i made this with my first band and he, he was just instantly being like wow i passed some sort of not cool test but like you know culture <laughs> sniff test for yeah. him you know and i've had all those sort of moments where it's like what's the right thing to play in the right room at the right time you know I have so many of those different stories that have, you know, led to fruitful relationships, whether it was with him or Kanye's producer, Mike Dean, or any of these other people. But um, I guess uh, the, the whole point of that thing is like, whether it's like an entrepreneurial idea, whether you're reinventing the paperclip or the shoelace, when you know you're right, people sometimes are going to look at you and think you're crazy because shoelaces have looked a certain way for so long that you're like creating Velcro. <laughs> You know, it's like, yeah, yeah, right. Why should anyone believe you? You know, to see the future is frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. If you feel like you have a valid passion for being right about the thing that you're creating, then, you know, keep hammering at home. Don't let other people, people convince you you're wrong. If you, if you have some kind of reason to really believe that you're right. So, um, audio up was kind of born from you working on your own album and kind of listening to it and being like, this is a, soundtrack to a story that hasn't been created yet and then you kind of created the bear and a banjo podcast that you had mentioned prior and then at some, at some point along the line you brought in dennis quaid and i learned that he was never really listened to podcasts or anything like that before at what point were you like this guy needs to be a part of this and why um basically uh, like most great inventions i failed at the main thing i tried to create an album. The album did not uh, get the attention. It was like a three-year odyssey of trying to get labels and my partners to pay attention to it. And finally, I had just through T-Bone, who had produced the record, met Dennis, who I learned to be uh, one of the most interesting people I'd ever met. He is, if you look back at the roles he's played in his career, the one thing that rings true across all of it is the sense of authenticity. And his voice is pretty iconic. Um, you know, in his words, you know, he sat out some of the 80s because of just, you know, uh, all sorts of things around him. And he missed the opportunity to be in those Star Wars tentpole, like one movie changes it all private jet sort of thing. But he worked and he worked and he worked and, you know, everything from the parent trap to far from heaven to uh, day after tomorrow, which we're living in right now. Uh, <laughs> he just had this like really and the rookie, like so many just great stories. He's such a great storyteller. That after I met him, T-Bone was like, I feel like you guys should be working on something. Next thing I know, we're about to shut down Bear and a Banjo as an album. I'm going to have to write it down. And uh, at that point, uh, I watched Ballad of Buster Scruggs and I go, oh my God, I wrote a musical. And then iHeart, who I'd been doing jingles for, bought a podcast network. I was like, this is crazy. Call up Dennis. I'm drunk on my couch. I go, Dennis, you're going to be in my podcast. He's like, oh, I'll be a guest on your podcast. I was like, no, no, no. We're making a movie for your ears. It's hard to explain. And, he, and I was like, it's like, oh, brother. Oh, so we're making a movie. No, no, no. We're not making a movie. We're making it just for your ears. And then he's like, I get it. We go down to uh, CES in Vegas. We meet with iHeart. We had a one-page pitch. And we show up. I play some of the tracks. So like, wow, the music's good. And then they're like, well, what's Dennis doing? I was like, he plays a professor who wants to uncover the truth about uh, the bear and the banjo. And they're like, ooh, that's a great premise. And all we leave the hotel... Uh, and we're on it. He was rushing back to LA from the pitch, and he goes, "That was really flimsy." I think they bought it. And then <laughs> from there, I'm like, "Wow, we're in the podcast business." And you know, there were so many points in there where I felt like I should just quit. You know, my former employers uh, who bought our business at Jingle Punks told us to put the project away and focus on the core. And um, I remember I had one of those moments where I felt like my head, you know, was going to explode. The temperature rose from here to here. And I thought the top was going to blow off because I was like, this was my passion. This is what I wanted to do. You're wrong. That's what I thought. But again, I was wrong at that moment because I had spent, you know, X amount of dollars developing a bridge to nowhere. I had to continue. Like, you know, I always say I'm a bit like one of those robot vacuums, the room by bump into a wall and I turn around and get the rest of the room. I had to bump into the wall to figure out what I was really doing. That was different, different than putting out a record. And that to me opened the whole, blew the whole thing wide open for me. And I was like, Oh man, I think this is what I want to dedicate the next 10 years of my life to doing these types of projects. Yeah, no, I, that's awesome. And I really like the vacuum analogy where you have to run into a wall in order to know where you're going. Cause a lot of people like the only, I can't remember the quote, but the only, 
failure is in action. You know, a lot of people just kind of like sitting there not doing anything, but you sometimes it takes doing something to actually realize hitting a wall and then be able to pivot. So I've been trying to, yeah, exactly, exactly. So I've been trying to figure out the best way to describe audio up to somebody succinctly. So, and, and what I say is it's essentially kind of a podcast platform in which they do storytelling through a mix of audio and music. And I want you to either correct me or give your best, you know, 30 second description of what audio up is. We think that music will play a bigger role in an inherently audio uh, storytelling uh, medium like podcasting. Music has been challenging for a lot of the first wave podcast uh, companies because it's not in their DNA. Storytelling and news and comedy is in a lot of people's DNA, journalism. But um, I think that podcasts can be for music what music videos were for artists in the 80s. It could be a great way of engaging fans deeper. You know, our first, there's three layers of storytelling that we're going to have in Audio Up. One is those Baron of Banjo style things where it's song and story. Another where it's like, you know, we're starting with Dennis Quaid's talk show, The Denisons, really deep, interesting conversations, but very similar to what's happening in the space. You know, very easy for people to understand and digest. Um, you know, we've acquired a few other uh, partnerships, including Scott Lips, who has a great pop culture one. I have one called Occupational Therapy, where I talk to everybody from Ben Silverman, the former chairman of NBC and the creator of The Office, to Don Lemon, to NBA player JaVale McGee. And it's just how they got their interesting occupation and what it takes to get there. And it's sort of a spin on that I'm no longer Jingle Jared and I'm looking for a new job. Um, and then, you know, from there, below that is going to be a platform where anyone in the world who decides that they want to create podcasts, whether it's about making recipes or sharing educational uh, content or sharing, um, you know, uh, stories about their trip to the Antarctic and how they sled across it with dogs. Anyone can put it on. We, you know, there is no barrier to entry with podcasts and currently, but we want to make those tools super simple and maybe create an ecosystem ultimately where they can monetize and, you know, build it up much like YouTube, uh, has allowed, uh, people to do that for, uh, you know, the past de 13 years, I believe is the anniversary coming up of YouTube. No, yeah, it was, uh, actually, I think it was, I think it's 15. Cause, uh, yeah, it's 15 because I don't know if you get the, the morning brew. It's like a email list that's, uh, big email list that gets sent out every morning. And they said, they said it's YouTube's 15th anniversary and they give like a timeline of everything that's happened. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah, today yeah. in the news, they, they relisted the first video that was ever uploaded. Yeah. Yeah. They, that's exactly what they did. That's exactly what they did. Yeah. And then I got a blast from the past there said, uh, Gangnam style back in 2012 hit the was the first video to hit like 1 billion or something like yeah. that. Great. Crazy, to me, crazy. the first thing where I tuned in was uh, Lonely Island. I remember, you know, I knew what YouTube was, but then everyone was like, you got to see this clip. It was Lazy Sunday. And I remember that that, that just like blew the door open for comedy and pop culture. And obviously, I can't remember if Bieber was before or after that, but that, you know, then everything starts happening quickly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. They had him somewhere on the timeline, but I can't remember exactly where it was. Um, all right, so what do you think, you know, it's, it is a new... Uh, okay. in? Yeah, I'm good. I put it on the Wi-Fi. Thanks. Sweet. Um, what do you think over the past, however long you've been, you've been working with Dennis Quaid, I'm going to stick with him for right now. What do you think is maybe one of the biggest things that you learn from him and have made like a, a different decision with audio up because you, because he either pointed something out or you learned something from him. I will say that most of the people like the Dennis Quaid's, the Ben Silverman's, the, Oh my gosh, all the Steve Levitan's, all these people that I've been lucky enough to meet. The one thing that they have is a curious mind. I think there's many mm -hmm. people that are get, get to a level of success and they don't want to go anywhere near ideas that are dangerous or new or not theirs. Dennis could have easily just said, you know, upon meeting me, you know what, I'm happy doing film and TV, dude, good luck. The curiosity, the openness of his mind and his willingness to, he's a serious guy, but to not, uh, he's willing to take risks and even do silly and funny things like our marketing video that we did for the podcast on cassette tape, which I, you know, had pitched him he, when he likes something, he'll just first sit there and digest something and go, ah! And, like, that's when you know he likes something. 
And, you know, I've been uh, really lucky to also be able to bounce ideas off him because he's seen, oh my God, he's worked with the greatest actors, the greatest directors of all time. And uh, being able to hear his take on uh, working with all the different people he's worked with. And, uh, you know, when I'm working on Uncle Drank, being like, who should Uncle Drank be? And us having serious casting conversations, but a project that's essentially in my brain that doesn't even exist yet. And he's like, I should call Jeff Bridges. No, I should call, you know, uh, uh, Luke Wilson. No, no, no. We should call Gary Busey. Like, it's kind of amazing because he's willing to imagine a future. And I think that a lot of these people, like, again, Ben Silverman is kind of a genius. He looks to the youngest person in the room and he's someone who's like a guy who hires his assistant. And then like two months later, they're like the president of like a network. Um, but to me, um, the, the, I think that he is a curious mind and someone who's willing to, uh, for him, that's what he's opened up for me. He's continued to remind me that I'm never going to arrive. I still am on a destination. I'm on a journey to a destination. Right. Yeah, that yeah, I may never yeah. get to. You got to enjoy the, the process. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's what I always say. That's what I'll say at the end when I talk about the journey to the best version of yourself. You'll never get there, but you're always got to strive for it. Um, it's before, true, uh, really, like it's the work in progress always. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's kind of like almost one of those things where it, you, when you realize it's like, dang, I'm never going to be done, but it's, you have to just, you have to just soak that in. But before we started recording, you started talking about one of the shows that you guys are going to be having on um, audio up, make it up as we go and talked a little bit about that story. But I, I want you to just kind of give every, uh, everybody a little bit of a flavor for a couple of the different shows that you guys are coming on and what the kind of style of them is going to look like. So you can maybe use make it up as we go and maybe whatever another one that you're really. Yeah. About. So uh, the three that I'm really excited about uh, currently make it up as we go is sort of the crown jewel of what we're launching. That took, you know, that's a year and a half of development one of the biggest stars in the realm of country music has signed on and we're going to be making some announcements about that. But we have, you know, Craig Robinson from the office. I uh, partnered with a really amazing songwriter, Scarlett Burke, who one of, she was one of the biggest jingle writers prior to this and had written, you know, theme songs for Netflix and came to me with a whole bunch of music she had written in Nashville. And she said, I went there and the town slammed the door on me and I wasn't a good fit for it. And I was like, wow, that's a great foundation for a story. Let's write, basically working girls sit in the writer's rooms of Nashville, which we did with David Hudgens for Friday Night Lights as a part of it. Next thing we knew, we had this uh, partner uh, on the on the music side to help us complete the soundtrack, Nicole Gallion. She wrote Dan and Chase Tequila. And we really have this amazing story about persistence, how one song can change anything and everything. Um, that's coming out in Q3 of this year. We just wrapped production. We're doing that with iHeartMedia. Another one that I'm really excited about is Hero the Band. It's a, uh, you know, a project that we're doing with Lava for Good. You know, this is Jason Flom's company who's done uh, the, uh, the Wrongfully Accused podcast. But he also runs one of the biggest labels within Universal. He signed this band. And it's basically telling a fake version of how the band goes back in time to a party in the 80s. Their sound is very 80s new wave. And we've all at one point or another said to ourselves, man, I was born at the wrong time. And they get one night to experience how wrong they are about saying that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the music will be launched through um, uh, new episodes, same that we did with Bake It Up As We Go and Baron and Banjo. Finally, um, you know, I'm really obviously excited about the, the Dennis on. So I think that Dennis really could have a very strong voice in the world of podcast talk. And I'm just so proud of the interviews that he's been able to get. You know, the one coming up next week with Billy Bush, I was in the room when they record this pre COVID and it's not about gossip. It's not about uh, breaking news. It's about people that have had serious crossroads in their lives and spiritual reawakenings and Billy Bush, as much as people, he's not to everybody, a sympathetic character, what he went through to be basically kicked out of Hollywood for, for better or worse, anyone's opinion on the, the Donald Trump tape, that's everyone's opinion except for the fact that one person became president and the other person lost their job for being, uh, I guess, a willing or unwilling to spin. But his story of rebirth and the work he did on himself when most people would have quit, I was like, like chills and almost in tears sitting there recording it. And I was like, I can't believe how much work this person did. Because at some point you'd say to yourself, is it worth it? 
is it worth it to try and do all this fixing up of yourself if no one cares, if you're never going to get a second chance? If you're essentially, you know, he was saying that a big reflex point for a lot of males is, you know, obviously health and family is important, but taking away their career is uh, something that people really, that's their worst fear. And he's like, I thought after all these years of, you know, doing all this stuff, I'd never get a chance to come back. My point is that Dennis has been able to be comfortable enough as a celebrity in conversations with people where he's getting some great, honest conversations. Also his work with, you know, the, the Billy Bob, sorry, the Billy Ray Cyrus interview. I didn't, I did not know that much about Billy Ray Cyrus, to be honest. Like I didn't know that he was a spiritual guy and how embedded in the world of Nashville and country he was. I thought he was the achy, breaky heart, old town road guy. There's so much more that expands from the world of that conversation that made me just learn more about people that I just would have otherwise had assumptions about. Yeah. Well, those sound like awesome shows and I can't wait to listen to that Billy Bush one. I bet that's going to be awesome. Um, what do you, you said that Dennis Quaid does really, or does a really good job of getting open and honest conversations with some of these guests. What do you, th- what do you think are a couple of the things that he does in order to get that conversation to get somebody to open up and really tell the honest story. He's been through so much that he doesn't need other people's approval. He's not pretending to be someone else. I think a lot of times in people's lives, the thing that I've reacted to most with every collaborator I've been lucky enough to work with is their honesty. Pooh Bear, totally honest. Like Mm. you earn into his friendship, you earn into his creativity or you don't. He's not going to be there, you know, if he doesn't think that you're, you know, worth collaborating with. Um, Chris Christopherson, Nas, you know, all these people, like some of these creatives are singular minded people and, uh, Oh, look at, look at this person. <laughs> Thank you for some seaweed. But I would say that Dennis's authenticity and honesty is something that I really, as a, I wish I was more like that. I'm trying again, work in progress, but I think as I, I as I get older, um, I am learning to be way more accepting of everyone's point of view in life. And I like what I like. I grew up what I grew up with, you know, musically, comedy wise, storytelling wise. But uh, through him, I'm discovering, you know, new music, new uh, films, new books that I otherwise would not have, uh, you know, experienced. And look, he's a very spiritual person. I lack a little bit of that, but I'm, I'm a big believer in personal power. And I think that wherever your spirituality comes from, whether it's inside or outside, you got to embrace that. And if it works, it works. I love it. I love it. Well, we're going to be down to the last couple of questions here. So we've talked a couple of times about now how I say that getting to the best version of yourself is a constant journey. Um, so I want to want you to take a second to kind of visualize what you think the best version of yourself looks like. So if that person is here and you're currently here, what's a skill or a piece of knowledge that this person has that the best version of yourself has that you don't currently have? I'm going to learn to trust the uh, people around me that have helped me get to where I am and make me uh, put me in a a position of success. And you know, I think in my previous business, Jingle Punks, it was very much the Jingle Jared show where that business was very much for better or worse dependent on me. I was the Mickey Mouse and I was the Walt Disney there. So I was the mascot and the creator. I think in this new business, I would love to take more cues from, you know, the the Jeffrey Katzenbergs of the world where they're more comfortable behind talent. And there are days where, you know, early on, I'd look at the press sheet for you know promoting our business and be like, well, why do they just want to talk to Dennis? And I realized that that's a burden that I don't necessarily want to take on for the promotion of our business. I want to keep creating. I want to keep making. And in my old business, I don't think I would have ever allowed myself to be you know behind the scenes as much. And I'm getting a great joy out of collaborating with all the people in my world. Uh, and not every idea has to be mine, but I certainly I love problem solving. So if someone has a great idea being able to work with them to put the pieces together. And I think that will achieve a much more scalable result than what I previously had in my old business, which worked out great for me and my partners and everybody. And in fact, uh, you know, today we're celebrating the the official closing of all of our old business at Jingle Punk. So I'm having Zoom happy hour with my old partners and celebrating the end of that business as I am closing the documents to start my new business. So it's a very timely question. 
<laughs> yeah. I'm literally turning a page today. That's awesome. That's awesome. Congrats. Um, well, before I ask the last question, I want to acknowledge you, Jared. I think your ability to have the courage to be authentically you and be so confident and passionate about the things that you're working on and the projects that you're working on and to be able to be so persistent. You've mentioned, you know, a few times about how, you know, you gave some music away for free and you're like, no, I'm right. Like this thing that I have here is something special is something that's going to work. And for you to be able to stay consistent with that, I think is very rare and very unique. And I think it's really cool. Thank you. And again, when all else fails, just think, what would weird Al do? And that's, uh, <laughs> that continues to be my mantra. And I was lucky enough to have dinner with him last year. And it was one of the most, insanely special dinners I've ever had. And, uh, and uh, it was everything I was hoping for and more when I got to meet him. Yeah, that's awesome. And for those of you listening, his TED talk was all about how to stand out and be unique. And he talks about his mantra of what would weird Al, what would weird Al, weird Al do? So that's, that's the reference there. Uh, well, I want to make sure everybody goes out and supports you and supports the audio up. So make sure you go follow Jared on Instagram at Jingle Jared, and you can find audio up on Instagram as well at audio up media and you can go to audioup.com to find their shows and find information about all that. Is there anywhere else that people should go to Just, best uh, you yeah, guys? I got the Dennis on uh, Apple or Spotify, check the podcast out and thank you everybody uh, for checking it out. And if you like it, share it. Perfect. 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 Thank you well, so much for having me on. I appreciate you. Yeah, of course. Of course. Well, the last question as I've said, the, I think the best version of yourself is a constant journey. And I also believe it's a unique journey. I think the way that I get to the close, best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you get closer to the best version of yourself. So for you personally, if you could currently work on or do three things to get closer to that best version of yourself, what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? I always get back to the fundamentals. I would like to have closer relationships with my friends and family. I would like to eat better <laughs> and, uh, you know, exercise more and then read. Uh, I love, you can learn so much more by, you know, exercising that part of your brain. And I think when those three things, your, your, um, your personal and family is intact, when your health is intact and when your mind and and body when they're all in those state of, you know, synergistic bliss, which, you know, people don't get time to tend to that on a daily basis. Those can, you know, if you're tending to at least two of the three of those, you're going to feel great. Yeah. I love it. Three great things. That's all we got today, Jared. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great day.